Okay, so we should start. Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, the next installment of the QFT in Geometry seminar series. And today it's a great pleasure to have Natalie Paquette from Caltech. And she'll talk about coastal duality in field theory and holography. Um, if you have questions, please either unmute yourself or type them into the chat. Uh, but for other purposes, please just mute yourself and, and that's it, but ask questions. So please, Natalie. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me to give, uh, give a talk at this wonderful seminar series. Um, so today I'll be talking about some work in collaboration with Kevin Costello, some of which has appeared and some of which will, will appear later, um, about a mathematical subject called Kazool duality and its appearance in certain contexts in, in physics uh, in both field theory and holography. So today I'll start with the field theory and I'll, I'll try to get to some holography at the end. Uh, time permitting. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, the basic spirit of today's talk is going to be uh, essentially how to identify um, and elucidate useful mathematical structures underpinning uh, some interesting physical phenomena. And then, you know, of course, as always, once we identify um, a, a mathematical structure that's in play in, in some physics, we'll hope to exploit having that formalism and, and use it to learn, uh, learn some new things um, about, about the physical systems that we're interested in. And today, the basic uh, physical uh, context for, um, uh, or the basic physical context that supports uh, the appearance of this funny mathematical thing called Kazool duality that I'll explain is essentially the physics of defects in quantum field theories. And of course, we know from many people and, and from many different contexts, the great utility of, of discussing defects sort of beyond the usual paradigm of local operators in quantum field theory. So these are some kind of extended objects that, you know, maybe they give us a, a new interesting class of um, extended observables like Wilson loops. They could serve as useful order parameters. Sometimes they play well with interesting field theoretic dualities and, and so on and so forth. And today, um, I, I'd like to introduce this mathematical subject of Kazool duality because I'd like to propose that it's uh, the basic uh, mathematical answer to the question of which defects can be consistently coupled to a given bulk quantum field theory. Um, and of course, that's a very general statement and I'll have to add a lot more caveats and conditions and make it much more precise uh, as the talk goes on, which I will do. And in particular today, we're gonna to be focusing on supersymmetric systems where we'll have in mind the presence of some kind of twist or topological twist uh, that will render um, a lot of things a lot more ma uh, mathematically tractable. Uh, so in particular, um, we know that quantum that operators in quantum field theories enjoy some, uh, some operator product, which in a general context, in some general bulk quantum field theory and arbitrary dimensions can be some very fearsome thing. Um, and the idea is that on the support of these defects, well, we can also have local operators, but in the presence of a suitable topological twist, um, given, given a supersymmetric system, then um, the operator product on these defects will collapse to um, a much more, a more simple algebraic structure um, that we can get a much better mathematical handle on. And then towards the end of the talk, again, time permitting, I'd like to sort of take this understanding of Kazool duality and, and the physics of coupled bulk defect systems and try to apply it to string theory, where we think of D-brains as uh, defects uh, for a closed string theory. And we'll have to add interesting um, caveats and generalizations to the notion of Kazool duality um, due essentially to the back reaction of D-brains. Um, we'll, we'll get there later. Um, but as we know, having D-brains as defects in string theory, and in particular, if we properly incorporate, incorporate the back reaction, leads to all kinds of physical riches, in particular, the ADS-CFT correspondence. And it would be great to get a more precise mathematical handle um, on, on holography and, and, and our hope, and what I what I'd hope to present today, is that a suitable generalization of this funny thing called Kazool duality actually can give us a useful handle on some aspects of ADS-CFT, at least in special examples. Um, so today when I say defect, uh, what I mean for the purposes of this talk, so I'll start with some bulk quantum field theory um, get with some Lagrangian description in D dimensions, and I'll be considering some lower dimensional auxiliary quantum field theory uh, on the support of some submanifold. And we'll just consider coupling them again by some local 
a Lagrangian interaction term. So it's a defect in a special sense. You can think about it as just the coupling of two, two quantum field theories of different dimensionalities locally to one another. Um, and, and everything I'm gonna be saying today is also, also perturbative. So these are order type defects. Um, and that's, that's gonna be um, the context of today's talk. Okay, so uh, now what on earth is Kazool duality? So since this is the second slide of a physics talk, and normally if you saw this as the second slide of a physics talk, you want to just you know, break out the pitchforks and torches right away. So I wanna emphasize that nothing on this slide is going to be important or used heavily throughout the talk today. Um, the way I want you to think about Kazool duality for the talk is going to be in terms of a physical presentation that I'll get to uh, in the next slide. Um, but I, the point of this slide is just to emphasize that there's a pre-existing mathematical notion of Kazool duality. We'll prove that it's equivalent to the physical picture that I'll be presenting in the next slide. Um, the physical picture is completely how I want you to think of it. But anyway, this is just to sort of set the stage that there's um, a very rich and well-studied mathematical structure that has an independent life of its own and we'll be bringing it into physics to try and, to try and exploit it later in the talk. Okay, so, so with that preamble, what, what actually is Kazool duality? What sort of thing am I talking about? Um, so Kazool duality is a relation between a pair of algebras that I'll call A and A shriek. Um, so they're referred to as the causal dual of one another. And it's really a duality in the sense that if I do whatever this operation is twice, I get back the original algebra. And um, the best studied examples of Kazool duality actually relate to uh, what are called differential graded algebras. And in, in physical examples, we'll see what that means and, and, um, and make it more concrete. So the algebras are not isomorphic to one another. Um, they are related in interesting ways. In particular, we can construct the Kazool dual from a given algebra and vice versa. There's a formula that allows you to build one from the other. Um, and one of the sort of manifestations of the relation between these two algebras, in fact, the main one, is that even though the algebras are distinct, they're non-isomorphic, uh, they still have um, isomorphic categories of representation. Or more precisely, you have derived equivalents of their DG module categories, which I'm, I'm not going to use, make use of any of the mathematically precise versions of, of these words. Um, you can just think about them as equivalences of categories of representation. So somehow these different algebras have the same representation content. Um, now, again, I won't make use of this definition of the Kazool dual today. Um, but let's just kind of squint at this definition a little bit just to get kind of a flavor of, of what's going on here. Um, well, first of all, it, we, we can kind of go back to this, this, these adjectives differential graded and see that however I'm building this dual algebra comes in the form of, of these funny X groups. So if you don't know what they are, that's fine. Um, one thing you should notice right away is that they're, they're actually a complex. So that star indicates that there's some kind of graded structure. So there's graded subspaces and there's going to be some differential, hence differential graded, that moves you from one subspace to the other. So the prototypical example of a physical complex that you should have in mind is a BRST complex. And you should kind of have that intuition in the back of your mind. And indeed, we're, we're going to be using exactly that complex in physics very shortly. Um, so if you don't know what an X group is, that's also not important, but you should, the, the zeroth X group is, uh, is just the group of homomorphisms. So a zeroth order approximation to this thing, you should just think of it as homomorphisms. And, and basically whatever this is, is some kind of homomorphism from C to itself, where we think of C as, as just a trivial A module. Um, and whatever this is, it's, it looks like homomorphisms, roughly speaking, that commute with the action of A on, on, on C, on the kind of the trivial A module. So all that is to say, whatever this Kazool dual is, we started with some algebra and we're building some other algebra, really a complex, that is something like um, a big symmetry structure, like some, something that's, that's symmetries of, of this simplest A module. And that's kind of all, the, all I want you to have in the back of your mind, that somehow these algebras are related to one another. Um, uh, they're constructed uh, in a way that, um, that, that, that is completely based on symmetries. And, and we'll, we'll see 
much more why this is useful when, when I present sort of the physical version uh, in a moment. So, so the prototypical example of a, of a pair of Kazool dual graded algebras is if you have some vector space, you can look at the ordinary symmetric algebra on that vector space. Um, and you can think about it as a differential graded algebra where the differential is just trivial. So it's actually an algebra and we're just pretending to think of it as um, a simple instanti instantiation of some fancier thing. And this turns out to be dual to the exterior algebra on the dual vector space. So it's exchanging some kind of commuting thing with some kind of anti-commuting thing. And this anti-commuting thing actually is a complex. So it's, it's, uh, it's an operation that's trading honest algebras for complexes. And causal duality kind of always does this. Um, now, okay, I, all of this um, is, is a bit abstract. So I, I'd like to, for the rest of this talk, kind of forget the uh, traditional mathematical perspective and just go right to, to how to think of this physically and, and, um, and how, how to make sense of it in the context of defects. So there's a question actually in the chat for us and uh, Ken. Uh, do they have to be quadratic algebras? Thank you, Austin. Um, oh, sorry, I have accidentally gone back a slide. Ah. Um, for the purposes of today, you can just think of differential graded, um, the Kazool duality for differential graded quadratic algebras. Um, there are many generalizations for various other kinds of algebras due to some of the people uh, on this slide, um, but you should just have the quadratic example in mind for the whole talk. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, I guess I can, can I see the chat from where I am? Oh, okay, good. I can also uh, prompt you if there's something in the chat. Perfect. Okay. Um, right. So how, how do I want you to think of Kazool duality for the purposes of this talk today? Um, Kazool duality for me is going to relate an algebra of local operators in a bulk theory, at least the algebra when we bring them to the support of a certain kind of special defect, to a universal defect algebra. Uh, in other words, it's going to relate it to the, the most general algebra to which I can couple my original theory in an anomaly-free way in a manner that cancels all continuous gauge anomalies. So A is going to be the algebra from my original theory, at least the algebra that I get when I restrict my operators uh, to the support of the defect or, or get very close. And A shriek, the Kazool dual algebra, is going to somehow tell us about the possible couplings of a quantum field theory to a given defect. Now again, that's far too general. So let me tell you now the really precise context in which this works, give an example, and um, and then prove that it's kind of equivalent to that much more formal um, abstruse thing from the previous slide. Okay, so, so much more precisely, we're going to be talking about, for the moment, topological line defects in quantum field theory. So I'll always be in Euclidean signature, and I'll be considering some Euclidean quantum field theory in n plus one dimensions. And I'll assume that the theory is topological in one of the directions R. So the theory could be topological in all n plus one dimensions, it could be an honest topological field theory, or it can arise um, from some kind of super, uh, from some twist of a supersymmetric theory, where at least one of the directions um, has, has become topological, meaning that respect to the, um, the BRST charge or the twisted BRST charge, translations along that R direction have become exact in cohomology or trivial. Um, and I'd like to now ask the question, what's the most general topological line de defect to which I can couple my original quantum field theory? So let's say that, the, uh, that this line defect, remember viewing, when I say defect, I really mean an order type defect, um, is described by some auxiliary quantum mechanical system supported on that line, and that quantum mechanics has some operator algebra B. And um, it's also a topological quantum mechanics, uh, so the Hamiltonian is trivial. I can move uh, the operators along the line with impunity. The only sort of non-trivial thing that happens is that operators can cross each other. Um, so the, this quantum mechanical operator algebra B should have the structure of an associative algebra. Um, so too should the operator product uh, from the original theory A when I bring it to the line. Um, so it's a topological line in the original theory and to it I'm trying to couple some topological quantum mechanics. Um, then the answer to uh, the previous question is the following. Uh, any coupling of, my, uh, of the theory, the auxiliary theory with algebra B to the original theory, which has a line algebra A, for any choice of B that I wish, um, it's 
at any, any possible defect that I could couple to it, um, is the same as giving an algebra homomorphism from the Kazool dual to B. At least any consistent coupling, meaning that the coupling is free from continuous gauge anomalies. That's the meaning of consistent uh, that I'll have throughout this talk. Of course, in general, there are other consistency conditions in physics that you could apply. Um, and this is, this is a strong condition. So the fact that this works for sort of arbitrary B is something that characterizes A, so, or A shriek. So in this case, A shriek is really a universal object. And from, from the previous slide, remember, I kind of constructed A in something related to, to symmetries, like, you know, things that kind of maximally commute with, with the original algebra in a certain sense. So it's kind of like, a, you know, you must be this tall to ride this ride. This, this condition is saying, you know, you must have at least this much symmetry to couple to this bulk quantum field theory. And if you have a non-trivial homomorphism from A shriek to B, that's that means you, you have, you, you furnish a representation of that symmetry, the, the symmetry that's big enough for you to consistently non-anomalously couple to the original theory. So homomorphisms from the Kazool dual to your auxiliary quantum mechanical systems furnish couplings of the bulk and defect quantum field theories to one another. And that's still pretty abstract, so let's do an example. Um, so let's consider our favorite topological theory, Chern simons theory with uh, Lie algebra G. Everything I'm doing is going to be local enough that uh, I won't need uh, a real form for the gauge group. I'll just talk about the Lie algebra G. And I want to consider coupling to topological line defects. Um, well, since the line is topological and the Hamiltonian is, the Hamiltonian is trivial, local operators um, uh, should have dimension zero. So I should write down some dimension zero coupling. And uh, indeed, I can try and just write down the most general dimensionless coupling that I can. Of course, as, as you would expect, uh, in this simple example, you know, I'll, although I'll phrase it in the language of Kuzul, duality will recover something very familiar and maybe a little bit obvious from physics. So I have my, my turn simons action um, in, in three directions. One of those three directions I'll, I'll choose to couple is going to be the direction of the line. Um, you know, the theory that I couple to can have any Lagrangian I choose. And then I try to couple it via this path-ordered exponential of, um, by, by coupling the T component of the gauge field along the line to some operators rho. So rho, rho are some functions of, of the fields along my auxiliary defect. It's, they're arbitrary. And, and in particular, they're elements of this, this auxiliary algebra B. Okay, well, how do I know that this coupling is gauge invariant? So throughout the talk, when I say gauge invariant, I'll be working uh, in the BRST formalism, as you might have sort of anticipated from the fact that I've been really stressing the fact that I want to work with complexes and it's complexes rather than just honest algebras that are important for making this story work. So let's insert the BRST variation of the gauge field into this putative coupling. It takes the familiar form. And then I can do some manipulations um, in order to uh, determine when, when that gauge variation vanishes. Uh, so you do some simple manipulations. Um, it's essentially the way you prove gauge invariant of a Wilson line. I mean, this really just looks like a generalized Wilson line from a certain point of view. And canceling the gauge variation ends up amounting uh, to requiring the following commutation relations along the rows. Uh, that row B, row C, minus row C, row B, gives you um, the structure constants of the Lie algebra times row A. Or in other words, row A, satisfy the relations of the universal enveloping algebra of G. Um, so in other words, this, this thing is some kind of homomorphism from A shriek to B. Um, so, so, that's an, uh, so at least we see from this argument that having row A necessary to couple, uh, to, to couple my quantum mechanical system to my bulk theory. So in the language of the previous slide, a shriek is nothing but the universal enveloping algebra of G, or the current algebra. And this is exactly what we would expect a priori. I mean, what, what could these rows be other than furnishing the current algebra of, of my gauge algebra? Um, but of course, the point of, of having this formalism in play is that the notion of Kazool duality will be far more useful when we get to, to some, some more exotic examples later in the talk. So, so that was a shriek. Um, but I didn't actually tell you what A was in, in this example. Um, and you might say, well, okay, Chern-Simons doesn't have any gauge invariant local operators. Um, so 
is A just a trivial algebra? But, but in fact, again, we have to retreat to the point of view of really thinking about complexes rather than algebras. Indeed, we view A as non-trivial because we're going to remember the entire BRST complex. Um, so in other words, we, we keep the local operators supported at higher ghost number, which are the ghosts, and there's a non-trivial differential. So it's a really a differential graded algebra, and the differential is just the BRST differential. Um, and if we uh, want to specialize even further to, to the abelian case, so the structure constants um, are, are just zero, we actually recover this basic example of Kazool duality that I had on the first slide. Um, in other words, the R Kazool dual, the universal enveloping algebra, uh, you can just think of it as a symmetric algebra, a simple symmetric algebra, just because it's, 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 it's abelian. And this is really an algebra. It's all supported at ghost number zero. Our rows, remember, which are form representations of this thing are really giving us an honest associative algebra. Um, and A is the exterior algebra of the dual vector space. We can think of it that way. And this just comes from, from our free ghosts, but these are all supported at higher ghost number. So it's something that's trading an honest algebra for a complex. And again, you have this kind of symmetric exterior duality um, uh, that, that is very typical of Kazool duality. Um, so this kind of trading of honest algebras for complexes supported at higher ghost number is, is going to be sort of just a, a feature of all of the, the simple Kazool examples that we're working with today. Um, and, and of course, you can generalize this to non-abelian Chern-Simons theory. And there's also um, a very sort of well-established understanding of deformations of Kazool duality in the math literature, which physically translate to sort of turning on perturbative interactions. But, um, but I don't want to get into that today. It's a little bit more than we need. Okay, um, so what I did was just rephrase sort of a familiar, um, familiar argument for canceling continuous gauge anomalies in a formal way. And indeed we know that sometimes, in fact very often, we can have non-trivial gauge anomalies occurring at higher loops. This of course happens whether we wanna talk about coupling bulk defect systems in you know, more conventional language, whether we want to talk about Kazool duality, we have to worry about it. Um, and indeed, in, in various examples that we're interested in, sometimes we can get um, non-trivial gauge anomalies from, from diagrams at all loop orders. Um, now, the question is, you know, is this a problem or, or, or is it a feature? And in fact, uh, what we have come to learn from various contexts is that this uh, in, imposing the condition of cance uh, cancellation of gauge anomalies for, um, for the anomalies as they appear at higher loops uh, engenders interesting deformations of the classical algebras. So classically, in Chern Simon's theory, we had our current algebra. That actually is all there is. There's sort of nothing else to worry about there. In more exotic examples, uh, for example, there's a, four, a 4D cousin of Chern Simon's theory studied in this paper you can do similar manipulations with the allowed topological couplings and get some commutator, and the commutator looks uh, quite analogous to, to the current algebra we saw before. But you can have, for example, this two-loop anomaly, and demanding cancellation of that anomaly deforms that classical algebra to something far richer. In this particular example, they find the Yangian algebra, hence the local operators of 4D Chern Simons theory on a line Kazool dual of the Yangian algebra, but more generally, we have to be aware that, okay, if gauge anomalies occur at higher loops, we have to cancel them, um, and that will impose a different conditions um, on the, the putative defect operators. It deforms the Kazool dual algebra from what you would naively expect from the classical algebra, and oftentimes it deforms it into something uh, a, bit, a bit richer. Okay, so, um, Let's see, in the interest of time, I don't know that I want to go into the details of this slide, but I do want to stress that the argument, that, that argument that I gave in the context of Chern Simon's theory always works. Namely, this imposition of canceling continuous gauge anomalies can always be phrased in terms of that Kazool dual algebra. It's not that hard to show. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, I, I think, uh, in the interest of time. But before coupling these two systems together, the algebra of operators on a line is going to be the tensor product of A and B, this uncoupled system. 
And some kind of deformation along a line is generically going to take a form like this, where you have a path ordered exponential along the line of some one form operator at ghost number zero. Ghost number zero, just because it's of course a physical operator, and we're putting this term in the action. And so you want to study, um, you want to determine whether the BRST variation of this thing vanishes or not. And you can do some manipulations. Um, you get essentially like a master equation for the system, something that tells you the consistency conditions you need. And it's very analogous to the path integral manipulation I did um, for this generalized Wilson line. But if you demand something a little bit extra, namely because you have this condition of topological invariance, and in particular, I assume a strong form of topological invariance, namely that there's some operator Q hat in the theory that renders translations along my, my R direction trivial with respect to the BRST charge. Um, if you assume this additional, um, th this additional uh, condition, strong topological invariance, you can convert sort of the consistency condition for BRST uh, vanishing into a different equation. And this different equation is called the moore carton equation, which you might have seen in many other contracts, contexts as sort of a, a basic thing that tells you about deformations of a given system. You might see this in, in Lie theory and other contexts in physics. And so the space of solutions to the moore carton equation for this tensor product of two algebras uh, is what naturally appears from this path integral argument. And there's a very powerful and deep isomorphism uh, that's been established in mathematics independently that always relates that space of deformations to homomorphisms from the Kazool dual. So this always works for coupling topological line defects to bulk quantum field theories. Um, and, and so uh, th this Kazool duality statement is, is a completely general phenomenon for uh, coupling topological line defects to QFTs for all of these differential graded associated algebras uh, that arise. Okay. So that's cool. Um, what, what now? Well, of course, now you could, you know, take your favorite Kazool dual algebras, try to relate them to quantum mechanical systems, try and construct new examples of coupling bulk and defect theories together um, using, uh, using this uh, condition um, uh, of, or this different understanding of how to map couplings to, uh, to homomorphisms from the Kazool dual. Um, but for the rest of this talk, I'd like to do something a little bit different. I'd like to try and extend and generalize this notion of Kazool duality for higher dimensional defects with different algebraic structures. Um, algebraic structures that are a little bit richer and, uh, and, and interesting and ubiquitous in physics. So in particular, uh, you know, I will be a little bit modest here in the talk. We, we started with one dimensional defects, preserving a topological symmetry. The next step up in complexity is going to be studying a two-dimensional defect. And rather than requiring that the defect is topological in two directions, I'd like to do something just a little bit, a little bit um, richer and require um, that the defects are holomorphic, which is going to be the right structure for supporting a, a chiral algebra or a vertex algebra. So in other words, the oper it's not that the operators have sort of trivial translation dependence along the support of a two-dimensional defect, but rather we'll ask that the anti-holomorphic derivatives dz bar are the q exact things now. So the operators can still have non-trivial position dependence in the holomorphic direction z, but they can get poles as you bring them together. And this is exactly the right structure to have a vertex algebra or a chiral algebra. Um, uh, in other words, this is like the holomorphic half of a, of a conformal field theory. That's the structure governing governing the holomorphic sector. Um, and, and these are ubiquitous in physics. And we expect that defects, um, that there, there should be an interesting story relating um, uh, defects uh, in this new holomorphic sense also to some kind of generalized notion of Kazool duality. Um, and indeed, these should have various interesting physical ramifications, but these are kind of some of the consequences of studying Kazool dual pairs um, of vertex algebras have been explored elsewhere and in other work. Um, so I, I'll skip it today, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions about this afterwards or, or discuss more of some of, the, some of the applications on this slide a little bit, a little bit later on. OK, so now I need some kind of notion of Kazool duality for chiral algebras. And it turns out that although Kazool duality, um, as Asan's question kind of hinted, has been generalized in many different ways for something 
for, for many classes of, of algebras far beyond just associate, uh, associative algebras or differential graded associative algebras, there actually isn't a mathematical formulation of causal duality for chiral algebras. So at this stage, what we can instead propose is a physical prescription for talking about causal duality that mathematicians can hopefully take and formalize um, and uh, hopefully prove some useful theorems about causal duality in that context. And then again, sort of in a crosstalk, we'd like to, to take um, their results and, and make use of them uh, in physics even more. But for the purposes of today, let's define causal duality for vertex algebras in exactly the way that we should based on how I propose that we think of causal duality in physics. So take again some Euclidean quantum field theory, now in n plus two dimensions. And we'll assume that the theory is, hol is holomorphic along two of the dimensions given by some copy of the complex plane. So in particular, this kind of structure arises all the time in supersymmetric field theories in the presence of a suitable twist. So we'll assume that, that we've done such a procedure and, and localize the theory um, to have holomorphic dependence along two of those directions. Um, then we'll say, we'll claim that the Kazool dual algebra is the universal vertex algebra that can be coupled to the theory as the algebra of operators of a defect wrapping C. In other words, if you're going to couple a defect to your bulk quantum field theory, and it's a, it's a holomorphic defect supporting a vertex algebra, the vertex algebra better have at least as much symmetry as the Kazool dual algebra requires. In other words, I had better be able to write down a homomorphism from a shriek uh, to my defect algebra. Um, or in other words, again, any coupling of my putative defect vertex algebra to my original theory is going to be the same as giving a homomorphism from A shriek to B, but now the homomorphism is going to be some suitable map of differential graded vertex algebras. So preserving the, the somewhat richer algebraic structures um, that I'm introducing in this talk. Okay, so we're going to define Kazool duality that way for vertex algebras, and we'd like to compute the Kazool dual um, algebra for, for, theories that, for theories whose holomorphic defects we're interested in. Um, so we can do this you know, if, if we have a suitable, uh, a suitable theory, uh, a bulk theory with a Lagrangian description, we can proceed at the classical level quite analogously to what we did in the churn simons example. We can do some path integral manipulation. And as I alluded to, just as quantum corrections modified commutators in that 4D churn simons example for the topological line defect, so too can quantum corrections modify the vertex algebra and the holomorphic complex. And in general, you have to work order by order. You have to compute the BRST variation of diagrams at higher and higher loop order. You have to require that they cancel. This will impose some relationship among the operators of my defect. And now the relationship between these operators isn't uh, going to be a commutator, but rather it's going to be the operator product expansion of a vertex algebra. So you compute OPEs, by demanding cancellation of BRST variations of diagrams. Um, I should say one of the hopes of framing the question in the formal language is, is, is the hope that you know, um, we'll be able to eventually adopt proofs uh, from mathematics rather than having to work order by order. Um, but that's something that uh, is, is a bit of a hope for the future. At the moment, we can just follow our nose and compute things order by order with Feynman diagrams. So for example, I could consider holomorphic Chern Simons theory on three copies of the complex plane. It's a, it's a holomorphic cousin of Chern Simons theory. We know it arises from a suitable twist. For example, it's the world volume theory of, of D brains uh, in the B model topological string theory. So it shows up in that context. Um, you can write uh, the gauge field in terms of these anti holomorphic um, uh, one forms. And let's, let's say that of these three directions, we'll always choose to wrap uh, the defect along a plane with some coordinate z, and we'll just call the transverse directions w1 and w2. So we're introducing a defect at the location w1 and w2 are zero, and it has some operator algebra b. And now I proceed just as I did before. I try to write down all possible BRST invariant couplings with some arbitrary operators j that live in this operator algebra b. And requiring cancellation of, of the BRST variation of these couplings is going to give me uh, non-trivial OPEs for J. It turns out um, you have to make, make some kinds of arguments, but it turns out that this coupling here is the most general possible BRST invariant coupling 
uh, for a holomorphic defect in, in holomorphic term Simon theory. So it looks quite similar to the kind of generalized Wilson line we, we had before. J turns out to only to couple to this a, uh, Z bar component uh, of the gauge field, but you're also allowed to sort of act with an arbitrary number of holomorphic derivatives in the transverse directions. So we're indexing our operator as well by two integers, K1 and K2. Again, it's not totally obvious that this is the most general thing you can write down. You have to argue for it, but it turns out to be true. And so we can proceed diagrammatically and, and sort of represent this coupling uh, as we normally do by giving it a Feynman rule and pictorially it's represented by a kind of vertex like this, where we have our defect sitting here. We have our uh, operator insertion J and it's coupling to our bulk field uh, AZ bar or, or derivatives thereof. Um, okay. So we can proceed exactly as I did in the ordinary Turn Simons case. The computations get a little bit more technical, but morally um, the procedure is the same. Uh, the details are in the paper. It's nothing too bad. And we can start at the classical level by doing, again, exactly the same kind of manipulation I did for Turn Simons, but I can certainly rephrase it in terms of tree level Feynman diagrams, at least in preparation for going to, to higher orders. Why not? So I compute the gauge variation of the tree level Feynman diagrams and requiring that the two variations cancel each other, as I mentioned, gives a relationship between the Js. You get some non-trivial OPE, and perhaps unsurprisingly, you get something that looks very much like the current algebra of, of the Lie algebra. Certainly, um, we've all seen this OPE before um, in, in our conformal field theoretic contexts. And, um, okay, so the question is, does the story stop there? Or is the Kuzul dual algebra actually richer than just this? Do we need to correct it in order to non-anomalously non couple defects to my original theory? Well, of course, as, since I'm mentioning it, the answer is yes. There are gauge anomalies at higher loop orders, and you do need to incorporate those corrections, and it will deform the OPE in non a non-trivial way. Uh, for example, there's some loop diagram like this. It has a gauge anomaly. I won't give the details of the computation, but you can write it down. It's non-zero. And indeed, it corrects uh, this particular diagram corrects the classical OPE of two of those Js at some particular values of K1 and K2. So this was just the classical piece, and now we get some correction. And indeed, for the particular example of holomorphic transcendence theory, there are anomalous diagrams at each loop order with two external gluons. And as I said in general, you have to compute the contribution, and it will correct uh, the OPE of two suitable operators. J from the defect, um, and, and one needs to, to, to proceed order by order. So there's a, there's a, um, a rich algebraic structure and a very, a very non-trivial algebraic structure that's governing couplings of defects to, to bulk quantum field theories in the case of holomorphic transcendence theory. Um, let me pause for questions and, and check the time at this point, because I, what I'd like to do um, in the remaining time is to apply this notion of Kazul duality for chiral algebras to an example of ADS-CFT where uh, the boundary theory is going to furnish a chiral algebra um, and, and, and talk about that for the remainder of the time. So since I'm going to be shifting gears a little bit, maybe now is a good time to pause. Pause for questions. Sorry, maybe you said it and I missed it. Where did you use the fact that it's a duality? Um, I have not used the fact that it's a duality explicitly, but you can, if I had reversed sort of the setup of things, namely if I had some bulk quantum field theory and the operators when I brought it to the line furnished um, an algebra A shriek, then the dual would have been A. Um, so uh, although I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I'm saying something in one direction, it works in, in both directions. No, but I guess why, that happen, why does that happen? I mean, from the point of view of quantum field theory. Um, from the point of view of quantum field theory, so, so morally it... I mean, it's already a bit of a mathematical mystery, perhaps, why that happens, but um, I guess there are ways to wrap your head around it. But um, from the, So you've sure. described one uh, in terms of, the, of defects of a... Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the, the definition is not symmetric, the two don't play a symmetrical role. Yeah, it's, it's not obviously symmetric, but, but what you should think is, um, you should think about everything sort of happening on the support of the defect. 
uh, at least this is how I, how, how I would think about it. You think about things having, happening on the support of the defect. So you have a bulk algebra, uh, you have a putative defect algebra, but on, on the surface of the defect, they're, they're treated sort of democratically. In other words, if you want to couple one to the other, you need a theory with at least as much symmetry as the Kazool dual of the one gives you, but you can just reverse the logic and, and, and the same is true kind of in the other direction. But, but the utility of it is also that, so you have, these, you have these two algebras, they look quite distinct. Normally one looks like an ordinary algebra and one looks like a complex. Um, and it's true that there is a symmetry between them, but part of the usefulness is that, um, you know, you should work with whichever one is simpler to work with because the answers are symmetrical. Um, in, in other words, sometimes it's easier to compute things with a bunch of free ghosts rather than computing some algebra with some non-trivial commutation relations. Uh, so, so you can kind of exploit the fact that the algebras look quite asymmetrical, even though um, the symmetry structure sort of tells you that you can couple one to the other or vice versa. Does that kind of... Yeah, maybe I see. Thanks. Yeah. So, so indeed, in sort of the second half of the talk, we're going to exploit the fact that the algebras are distinct by working actually with the bulk theory. Because um, in the bulk theory that I'll be interested in, the algebra... Uh, is given by a complex of a bunch of ghost fields. And it turns out to be, in this particular example, easier to work with the bulk algebra and derive the chiral algebra of the boundary CFP, which has some pretty non-trivial operator product expansion. Um, but in principle, you could, you could go in either direction. Yeah, any other? Yeah, I just have a question about um, yeah. one comment you made. Um, yeah. you, the causal dual in some sense refers, uh, indicates some sort of symmetry. Um, yes. Is there a more precise sense in which that's true, in which the Kozul dual acts as some symmetry of the quantum system? Um, more precise sense in which the Kozul dual, um, so you mean more precise than, for example, the Kozul dual honestly being like the universal enveloping algebra, uh, like the Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess I mean a physical algebra. sense in which it would be like a physical global symmetry. Or, or indicate some type global. of physical global symmetry. Um, I, I, I mean, I, it's so. This is really a story about about gauge symmetries. Um, I, I mean, I would say that the causal duality is, you know, it's you need you need operators of your defect theory to furnish a representation of of the causal dual algebra. Sure. So and, and it's a, you know, serving as kind of a universal gauge symmetry in, in that sense. Sure. Um, it, or you can think about it as if you, if you look at the definition of, of a shriek as sort of an, as, a, as an endomorphism algebra of the trivial A module, it's like the maximal, you should view the Kazool dual algebras as like maximal commutants of each other in, in a certain sense, in, in a formal sense. If that doesn't make sense, don't don't worry. No, about that it. that makes sense. I guess I just I'm looking for something more in terms of a physical notion of that. I mean, I see how it acts as some sort of symmetry in a mathematical sense. Yeah. But in what sense that's a symmetry of the quantum system? Um, but yeah, thanks. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. So at, at the quantum level, you want to think of the Kazool dual, the the operators of your defect as having to form a representation of this big algebra. That's, yeah, that makes sense. I think that's really all I, I want to emphasize for this talk. Sure. Um, um, related to that question, um, um, what is the distinction really of global versus gauge? So because you would expect um, the symmetry on the bound, on the defect to be some sort of uh, global symmetry, whereas in the bulk is a gauge. On one hand, we sum over, we integrate over the symmetry, on the other hand, we don't. So it's it's confusing how this how I should understand this this this, this point. Um, so so at this point, uh, all all I want to sort of, not, not thinking of, of ADS CFT for the moment, I, I just want to have in mind the picture of coupling two systems together and requiring that the coupling is anomaly free with respect to the gauge symmetries of, of the bulk theory or with, with respect to the, the gauge symmetries of the original problem. Just as I would want gauge anomaly cancellation for an individual quantum system, I would also want gauge anomaly cancellation for, for a coupled bulk defect system. Uh, so that's, yeah, that, that's 
really the, the only symmetry structure that I'm, I'm using right now. So, so the, the causal duality, the causal dual algebra is constructed simply from the requirement that this coupled system has no continuous gauge anomalies. So from that point of view, the, the, the distinction of, no, of global versus gauge is, is not at all important. No, it's purely a gauge anomaly. It's how we decide how to sum over things. Um, but, 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 but this is then just anomaly cancellation for the bulk symmetry, right? The boundary thing, the, there should, the anomaly shouldn't go away. Um, and, 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 and yeah, in fact, you actually don't care from this setup. In fact, you actually don't care from this setup. Um, sorry, I'm not, not sure I understood the, the last part of that. You're canceling bulk anomalies, right? If the symmetry is a global symmetry on the boundary, it could have a gauge anomaly. It can, sorry, it can have anomalies which, which are there. Uh, you're right, so I'm, so I'm only canceling gauge anomalies for, arising from, from the coupling of the defect with the bulk at this, at this stage. In general, there can be other non-trivial you know, in, in general, you can imagine the Tuft anomalies and, uh, and all of that. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, I, I should say that um, I would be very interested to know how imposing other physical consistency conditions that go beyond canceling continuous gauge anomalies, how those interact with the causal duality picture. For example, even cancellation of discrete gauge anomalies. So uh, that I, I would like to formalize at some point, but there, there's certainly other, other symmetries and consistency conditions that one should be taken care of in general. Causal duality is just about, about, uh, about canceling the bulk gauge anomaly, or the gauge anomaly for the coupled system. Okay, so let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay. So I'm a little short on time. Uh, I would like to say something about holography. Um, I should also say that in a couple weeks there's string math and I will be giving a sort of a different version of this talk where I'm switching the order and emphasizing different things. So even if I run out of time for a lot of the holography stuff in this talk, that's sort of the part of the work that I'll be emphasizing and leading with in two weeks. So. I will endeavor not to run out of time and test anyone's patience, but if one is interested in more details about things that I have to go quickly through today, I'll, I'll, I'll be saying more uh, in, in a few weeks. Okay, so what about, what about holography? Can I apply any of this mathematical machinery to examples of the ADS-CFT correspondence? using the fact that I'm remembering that the ADS-CFT correspondence, at least in the top-down examples that I like the best, start life as a coupling between open and closed string theories. Um, the answer is sort of yes with an asterisk. I'll need to modify the notion of causal duality to appropriately account for the back reaction of the D-brains, which is so crucial in deriving um, these ADS-CFT dual pairs uh, from top-down construction. Um, and as in in everything in this talk, I'm going to be imagining that I start in a supersymmetric system and that I do a suitable twist, um, in this case, to render some of my directions holomorphic and the directions along which I'll couple the defect. So I'll be focusing on an example of uh, AD the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence, perhaps the technically simplest example, where on the bulk side, I have type 2b supergravity on ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. And on the boundary side, I have some CFT on the moduli space of the symmetric orbifold theory in the limit that n goes to infinity. Um, so there's a notion of twisted holography in the sense of, of Costello and Lee that I'll use today. Um, many computations that Kevin and I do in the work that's appeared are quite analogous also to computations that appear um, in a version of twisted holography studied by Costello and Giotto, and that's in the context of twisting n equals 4 super Yang Mills and its um, ADS5 cross S5 dual. Um, well, so today let's just think that uh, for twisted holography, we're restricting again to some kind of subset of protected cohomological observables in my full uh, physical duality. Um, it should be a nice toy model of holography and more optimistically, um, assuming the conjectures of Costello and Lee, this, the particular toy or twisted version of holography that I'll be studying is genuinely going to be a part of this original physical duality. 
Um, so I'll explain what, what the dual, the twisted dual pair is, but we believe it, it's in, it indeed, the cohomological observables that we study are indeed a subset of the full physical observables of physical theory. And ADS3 CFT2 is very nice because it's a bit of a Goldilocks case physically. It's quite rich. There are loop, uh, interesting loop effects, um, many of which have already been studied in the full physical duality that we can compare to our twisted framework. But nonetheless, we have a hope of saying some mathematically precise things and, and really getting a handle on it. And today I'll mostly focus on illustrating the role of my version of Kazool duality uh, in this holographic setting. As I mentioned, we'll have to deform it to account for the back reaction. Um, okay, so what's the dual pair? Well, I, as I already said, I'd like to imagine that the CFT2, you know, that's going to be sort of the location of the defect theory, if you will. I've done some holomorphic twists. So I've, I've in, it localized to kind of the chiral algebra subsector of the CFT. Um, and correspondingly, there should be some dual twists in the bulk theory whose observables carry, carry that same information. Today, I'll be focusing on the twist of the supergravity side or the, the toy, the toy uh, subsector, if you want, of, of the supergravity side. I'll be doing my computations there. So that'll serve as my A, my algebra A for Kazool duality. And I'd like to derive A shriek, which should again be telling me something about the, you know, the universal symmetries to which I can couple my bulk twisted supergravity theory as a defect. And in doing so, we can produce operator product expansions from the dual CFT. And proceeding order by order in Kazool duality, this uh, order by order in one over ed in this case, uh, we um, compute non-trivial quantum curvatures to these OPEs. That's, uh, that's going to be kind of the moral of the story. Um, so to set the stage and to, to, to give some notation, let me just quote some of the results that you get um, by, uh, by studying a twist of 2B supergravity on ADS3 cross S3 cross C4. I'll go in a little bit more detail of, of the bulk theory, but let me just sort of tell you what you can do, uh, like what, what results you can get. Um, in the twisted theory, you can enumerate the single particle supergravity states. Um, you would expect that these correspond to some nice BPS states in the physical supergravity theory. Um, if you remember from this example of the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence, uh, the bulk, uh, uh, the bulk um, superconformal field theory or the asymptotic algebra, or so, excuse me, the boundary superconformal field theory or the asymptotic algebra of, uh, of the bulk theory um, is two copies of the n equals four superconformal algebra. Since we've done a holomorphic twist, we get the holomorphic half. So we would expect to know something about, um, about just a single holomorphic copy of the n equals four superconformal algebra. And the global subalgebra of that n equals four superconformal algebra is uh, PSU one one two, and in particular, uh, it's in the physical supergravity theory. It's known that the single particle uh, supergravity states form short representations of that of that global uh, global subalgebra. And indeed, in the twisted context, when we enumerate um, the single particle states there, we recover that result, which is reassuring. We can also compute, again, though I'm not telling you how, um, we can compute the Lie algebra of gauge symmetries in that twisted supergravity, which should be dual, again, to the global symmetries in the conformal field theory. In particular, we had better, in, as a subalgebra, uh, obtain this PSU112, but the global, uh, the global symmetry algebra can be larger. You, know, you have to include modes of suitable, uh, a certain uh, subset of the modes of all of the single particle supergravity states. And you, can, uh, and you get some very huge and interesting algebra for twisted supergravity. Um, let me just tell you the bosonic part because it has a nice geometric interpretation. Uh, you get a certain algebra of holomorphic divergence-free vector fields on a supermanifold that I'll introduce very shortly uh, that we called the superconifold. And again, this is all so far in the end goes to infinity on it. But we can identify a huge infinite dimensional algebra that's the global symmetry algebra for this twisted theory which again in the bulk is, is really the Lie, Lie, Lie algebra of gauge symmetries that preserve the vacuum. Okay, um, and again, there's a, a story on the dual CFT side, which I'll defer for today and, and various you know, checks of just the twisted duality independently of Kazool duality where you compare correlation functions on the one side with Witten diagrams on the other side. And again, I'm going to completely defer all of that today and, and, and leave it for later on. For the rest of the talk, let me, proceed 
by studying this holographic duality from the point of view of someone who's interested in Kazool duality, who wants to start life with some twisted open string theory coupled to a twisted closed string theory and ask, given that I know, in this case, the twisted closed string theory, what's, what's the Kazool dual? What, what are the symmetries that I need to couple, the, the universal thing that I can couple to my closed string theory? Because in particular, the open string theory had better enjoy those symmetries and that should still be realized in, in the dual CFT. So, um, so let me uh, do that. So as I said, for today, I'm going to work with the twisted bulk theory. And um, what, what is the twisted gravitational theory? So there's a conjecture uh, arising from Casello and Lee, work of Casello and Lee that we'll assume for this talk. Um, so we can assume that the conjecture is true, in which case the theory that I'm about to tell you should really be viewed as, as a, sub, uh, a subsector, roughly speaking, of the full physical duality. Or if you wish, you can just think of me in this talk as studying some kind of special topological string and studying a toy model of, of twisted holography in that sense, if, uh, if you're feeling uncomfortable with the conjecture, although I think there's very good evidence that the conjecture is true. Regardless, the idea is that there is some kind of twist for type 2b, the type 2b string on R10, such that the twisted theory is Kodaira Spencer theory, or that's the, the close, that's the target space theory of the B model topological string, uh, also in flat 10 dimensions, although on C5, because it has, <clears throat> has some holomorphic uh, dependence. Very similar arguments uh, apply, or in other words, we can make use of this conjecture in C3 times, times T4 which is kind of the, the starting point that we would want if we were to derive a twisted version of this ADS-CFT duality. Um, so the twisted closed string sector should be Kadira Spencer theory. Kadira Spencer theory has been studied uh, originally by Bershadsky, Chikati, Ogori, and Vafa. And the basic field of Kadira Spencer theory at all ghost numbers, remember I'm, I'm always thinking complexes, is going to be the space of polyvector fields on, on your kalabi manifold. And if you don't like poly vector fields, well, on a kalabi manifold, you can always trade them for differential forms. So you can think of the basic field as just ordinary differential forms on my kalabi in this case, C3 times T4. You can also identify fields sourced by D-brains, uh, the twisted descendants of ramon ramon uh, fluxes, which are important for incorporating the back reaction. So if you compactify this Kodaira Spencer theory on T4, well, you get some poly vector fields in the transverse six dimensional space, and from the compactification, you just pick up harmonic forms on T4. That's keeping the massless content. And to each of the, um, the forms on T4, so there's four, four generators of the cohomology ring of T4, the DZ1, DZ2, DZ3, and DZ4. I'll, I'll just rename them as etas. So there's some anti-commuting variables. And so I'm tensoring in this simple ring of anti-commuting variables to the polyvector field on this. That's all that compactifying on T4 gets you in the twisted world. Similarly, as usual, we want to add our open string sector, our D-brains, in order to compute the back reaction and derive the dual pairs. In this case, they're B-brains coming, uh, coming from the B model. And um, more precisely, we'll, we'll add N D1 brains on a copy of the complex plane CZ. Remember, think in mind that this is going to be our, our defect world volume. Um, so there's some C in C3. And similarly, N, uh, N5 D5 brains that wrap the same plane in, in flat space and also wrap the T4. And um, n1 times n5 is n, as usual in this, in this setting. OK. So you need to compute the back reaction when you have d brains in the game. There's an explicit computation in Kadira Spencer theory that you can do. So we just do it. Um, it turns out that the RR flux sourced by the b brains in this, in this twisted theory gives you actually a Beltrami differential. So Beltrami differentials give you deformations of complex structures of my transverse space. In this case, we have C3 we remove the support of the brains, that C plane parameterized by Z, and we ask what the complex structure deformations are in that space. And the Beltrami def differential gives us an explicit uh, complex structure deformation. Um, so normally in the physical theory, this back reaction uh, takes us from uh, R6 with R2 removed to ADS3 cross S3. Here, we'll get something a little bit different. Um, and it turns out when you do the computation, um, this Beltrami differential or these def deformations of complex structure, which again you should keep in mind as 
some components of the physical metric. So in a twisted theory, we don't have the full physical degrees of freedom coming from a full fluctuating metric, but the twisted theory keeps some of the components. And in particular, in this holomorphic twist, this, this twist that gives us Kadira Spencer theory, we retain the complex structure deformations as our proxy uh, uh, for the metric degrees of freedom. Um, okay, so we do the computation of this back reaction, we get our complex manifold, and it turns out that we have a manifold um, that, that is described by this equation in four complex variables. So this equation that I'm circling here. Okay, so, so what on earth is this thing? Well, if I just had a number on the right-hand side here, then this would exactly be the equation for a deformed conifold. Uh, the deformed conifold is a complex manifold. Um, you can think of it as equivalent to ADS3 cross S3 as a complex manifold, Euclidean ADS3 cross S3. But in this context, in my, with my T4 compactification, I don't just have a number here. I have, I have well, I have a, a tensor FAB contracted with two of these eta variables, which are given by um, homology classes in T4. Uh, in particular, F encodes the flux or the number of D brains if we integrated it over, over um, all of the eta variables. So it's some kind of super manifold. And we call it the super conifold because it's very much like the deformed conifold, but it really has these anti-commuting variables in the game. Well, one thing that I want you to notice that's important for the super conifold is that, well, we have this F tensor. So F is an element of H2 of T4. Its length is N, N1 times N5, the number of D brains. So we have some vector and cohomology of length N. Um, but since this F lives in the cohomology ring of T4, well, we know that F cubed is going to be zero in the cohomology ring. We just don't have that many dimensions. And therefore, whatever this funny super manifold is that generalizes the conifold, it actually, it only differs from the Kadira Spencer theory in flat space by a finite number of terms. So there's a huge simplifying feature uh, coming from doing this, this twisted computation. Somehow the variation of Kadira Spencer theory from flat space when you include the back reaction of the D brains just truncates. And this is a feature that seems special to, to this example. It doesn't happen in twists of higher dimensional theories, but it's an amazing simplification that we can make a lot of use of. So the punchline is that twisted supergravity in this sense on ADS3 cross T4 is Kadira Spencer theory on the super conifold. And let me just check what I'm doing on time. Okay, so I, I need to wrap up. So let me, let me briefly tell you what having this Kadira Spencer theory on, on the super conifold buys you. Again, we, we, we're essentially computing the Kazool dual of that, um, of, of, of this theory. So as I said, you enumerate the super gravity states, you can do it, you recover the physical result. Um, in, in other words, you get these short reps of SU112 that, um, uh, that, that we saw previously in, in the seminal work of DeBoer and others. So, okay, you know, we can write down the states even in the holomorphic context. We identify their quantum numbers, all is well. And we ask what chiral operators can we couple to, the, to this Kadira Spencer theory as a defect. Those should be our dual twisted CFT operators. For the moment, let me turn the back reaction off, remembering that any answer I get will differ only from the flat space theory by a finite number of terms that I can compute, um, uh, which, is, which again is, is not something that you can necessarily do in general. But you can write down couplings of these Kadira Spencer fields alpha to some putative defect fields. So here's just two, two of my Kadira Spencer fields that I'm calling alpha and gamma. And you should notice that they couple to defect operators by terms very similar to what we saw in the holomorphic turn Simons example. And some of these, these G operators are nothing but the n equals four superconformal supercharges. Similar operators coupling to other fields are nothing but the SU2 R currents, the stress energy tensor, and and, um, and uh, generalization thereof. Again, run through the same classical argument that we did before. Compute the gauge variation of these couplings, require that they cancel, and obtain some non-trivial OPEs. Again, so far I'm working in flat space, so I'm lying a little bit. But back reaction is not that hard to incorporate. We just get something called a, a deformation of Kazool duality. In other words, we have some extra term in the action that accounts for the back reaction that's coupling the Beltrami differential sourced by the D brains to my Kadira Spencer theory. It turns out that the gauge variation of this back reacted term is non zero, but it's only non zero on the support of the brains. It's, it's an, in other words, it's an integrable complex structure deformation away from the support of the brains. 
So rather than demanding that the universal chiral algebra couples to the bulk gravitational theory um, such that the whole BRSP variation vanishes, instead we ask that the universal chiral algebra has a non-zero anomaly to cancel off the non-zero anomaly of this back reaction term in the bulk from the Beltrami differential. So it's very, very similar in spirit to what we did before. We just ask for, for cancellation instead of vanishing at the gauge anomaly. Um, diagrammatically, you get a new vertex. So here's the brain, here's the Beltrami differential field, and again, it's coupling to some bulk fields and it's deforming us away from flat space. In particular, this back reaction is coupling to the identity operator of my chiral algebra. So you can see right out of the gate that among other things, this back reaction uh, coming from, the, uh, this coupling coming from the back reaction will centrally extend the algebra that I got in flat space. And otherwise it will, it will deform it in more interesting ways. Um, okay, so you can run through the computations in exactly the same way. I'll spare you the details. But again, we get, among other things, non-trivial central extensions coming from, from including the back reaction. And again, we work order by ordering perturbation theory and compute the resulting deformations of the OPEs. So we're getting some structure constants in our deformed Kazool dual algebra, which should be dual to some, uh, some coefficients related to particular two-particle scattering processes in the back reactant geometry. Um, in particular, what do we recover? Well, of course, if we looked at the global symmetry subalgebra, we recover that PSU112 from the OPEs that we compute, as you would expect, but we, um, but we get more than that. And in particular, as n goes to infinity, one recovers that big global symmetry algebra that I was hinting at before, whose bosonic part is the algebra of divergence free vector field on the super console. So it's a hugely algebra of gauge symmetries preserving the vacuum. It's a huge infinite dimensional algebra, um, a dually of the chiral algebra. And, um, and incorporating the back reaction uh, it is essential to getting that matching correct. Um, and that property that F cubed is zero really saves us from having to sum up an infinite number of diagrams. You know, we only, can, we only have so many of these extra flux legs that, uh, that we can add before things truncate, it, at most two of them, because F cubed is zero, as, as one can argue. So you just have to compute diagrams like this in order to more generally get the universal chiral algebra for the defect. Um, that again includes, among other things, the n equals four super conformal algebra with the central extension. So to leading order in one over n, back reaction only gives us four classes of diagrams, four new diagrams, um, very computable. And you can go beyond the planar limit and compute one over n corrections as well. Um, there's more to come on that uh, in, in work in progress. Okay, so that's it. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. So uh, Kazool duality from defects. We've learned something about universal defects to which we can couple a bulk theory. You can obtain the defect algebra from the bulk algebra or vice versa, order by order, with Feynman diagrams by requiring that the theories couple non-anomalously. It turns out to be useful in twisted holography, viewing these things as really just couplings between open and closed topological string theories in the cases that I'm studying. It requires a deformation to account for this back reaction, but you can still proceed in the same way. And indeed, you can obtain the uh, algebra of boundary local operators from Kazool duality in the dual pair that I studied. And um, it, even in the n goes to infinity limit, you see um, a huge infinite dimensional Lie algebra of, of gauge symmetries that includes the, the familiar subalgebras that you expect. Much more to come in various directions. As I mentioned, more computations, uh, various generalizations uh, in the twisted holographic context that I don't have time to talk about. Um, and of course, there's a lot more we'd like to know. And in particular, this truncation gives me some hope that um, perhaps we can even prove mathematically and rigorously some all orders results using techniques from homological algebra and by formalizing this notion of Kazool duality in the vertex algebra and deformed contexts. Um, and I hope there's a lot more that we can learn um, in various directions, um, but I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, clap in the limited ways that we can clap. <laughs> so thanks very much. It was a very nice talk, Natalie. Are there any questions? You can just unmute yourself and ask or type in the chat.
So perhaps I can ask, um, you mentioned this work by, um, yeah, you just click it away. Yep. Um, by Gabardil, Gopakumar, and Eberhard. Um, what is the relation to that? Um, the, yeah, those results so, there? So, so, yeah, this is something that I'm thinking about right now. Uh, of course, what they, they really study um, the dual, the, the string theory dual yeah. at the orbifold point of moduli space, yes. whereas what we're doing is really something at the at the supergravity point. And um, for operators that are sufficiently protected, that should be fine up to some change of basis. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I need to understand better sort of, um, you know, I need to understand the precise relation a little bit better for uh, I would say a quarter VPS rather than just half VPS mm -hmm. operators, for example, you have to be, have to be a bit more careful. Um, but yeah, I would love to connect sort of the space-time supergravity Kadira Spencer theory mm -hmm. to a world sheet theory and, um, and see what we can say there. But right now we're a priori at different points in, in moduli space. Okay, any other questions? So I should remind everybody that in about 20 minutes, so the school will have, the school that's been running all week um, will be having this uh, gong show and poster session. So I think we'll just stay on this call, um, but we can perhaps thank Natalie first and there could be some informal discussions after that until the gong show starts. So let's thank you again and uh, you can feel free to actually I'll stop the